Choose to not be first. Do we do enough? Well, I, I never, never shut up about it. Uh, it must have been about 17, 16, 17. We nicked their guilt rings. Right, the bouncer's guilt ring. This is no good for me. That's the reality. If you want the honest truth, and I see it every day. Welcome to the Fights That Made Me podcast, hosted by myself, Umar Ahmed. I'm joined by professional boxing trainer, Ben Davison. How are we doing today, Ben? Good, mate, you? I'm very well, thank you. So, yeah, we're just going to go through your highs, your lows as a professional boxing trainer. Um, we're going to go back to 2016 mm -hmm. in Scotland, uh, Billy Joe Saunders uh, against Akavov. Um, I'm sure he admit not his best performance, Billy yeah. Joe Saunders, so... Just um, talk me through that fight, please, Ben. Um, yeah, I mean, it was obviously Billy Joe had had a long spell with Jimmy Jimmy Tibbs. Uh, no secret that Billy Joe's sort of known to go up and down in in weight, and in preparation for that, you know, it was, it was excessively bad. I think people probably remember the pictures of Billy Joe running up the mountain with the sunglasses on and the big belly. I think people were shocked to see the size of him. Um, and he was really struggling to, to get the weight off. So him and Jimmy ended up splitting, I think it was about three or four weeks before the fight. I think at that point it looked like the fight wasn't going to take place. And then um, things changed and, and I think Frank Warren managed to find a venue and a date somewhere in Scotland for, for, for Billy Joe to defend his title. And I think he needed to defend it. I think it had been a while since he defended. I think it, it was almost a year, actually. And, um, you know, I remember going into the fight, there was talks of, of opponents, and it might be this guy and it might be that guy. I'm not going to name no names, but there was one opponent that Billy Joe quite liked, and I was like, mate, like, I, I know how this fight is going to go and how it's going to look because of the situation of how you're having to lose weight. And just a story in preparation for that fight, Billy Joe struggled to do six rounds one day in, in, in training camp, got out of the ring and was like shaking, just had no energy in him, had nothing, was eating nothing. Um, and actually a funny story of in preparation, he was that <laughs> frustrated in preparation. He knocked the sparring partner out. Um, but I remember, you know, I wasn't known, I'd, I'd come in and sort of replace the, the British boxing legend in Jimmy Tibbs. Um, but I'd known Billy Joe for a long time, so I remember rounds were going by and there was a particular round that Billy Joe had lost. But in the corner I told him, you know, you won that round simply for the fact that I knew the type of character Billy Joe is and Billy Joe's well, well aware of it as well. That if I had told him at that moment in time you lost that round, he would have given everything to win the next round. And I knew that the tank was far from full. So we had to be very economical enough. You know, part of the reason why we went with Akovov and not the other opponent was because the lack of experience at that level. And I just thought if Billy Joe can save it and, and give his push in rounds eight, nine, 10, 11, it may just creep in enough doubt into the, the opponent's head um, am I capable of doing the rounds at this level? You know, championship rounds, I haven't really been there, haven't really been there at this level. Am I going to be able to finish strong? And it might just break the will of Akavov for Billy Joe to sort of see through the fight. That's sort of what happened. But yeah, a lot of criticism at the time um, for me and for Billy Joe. But um, highs and lows. I will say after that, I started to think to myself, do I, do I really want to get into this? Um, based on, you know, the, the criticism. It was probably my, well, it was my first experience of, of that sort of stuff. And I was thinking, I don't know if this is sort of the road that I would like to take. But, um, yeah, stuck with it and pleased that I did. Did you question yourself as a trainer at all? Yeah, it was difficult because it's hard for me to say. I didn't, I wouldn't say that I sort of, I didn't have a chance to lead the preparation, so to speak, for that fight. I was only, I think I was 23 or something like that, I think. Um, you know, there was a couple of weeks leading into the fight where Billy Joe and Jimmy had, had parted ways. You know, 
things were not good. And I remember, Ty, actually, that was one of the first times I had a proper conversation with Tyson, actually. Tyson come up to the fight. Um, he was aware of the situation with Billy Joe and his weight and sort of how the fight was going to go, etc. And um, and that's when me and Tyson first got talking, actually. You sound um, sort of quite assured about what went wrong in terms of that night with Billy Joe, in terms of preparation, um, especially in the corner as well, the, the advice you were giving him, specific advice. So you knew what you're doing. So why did you question yourself? Just probably, I didn't question myself in terms of do I know what I'm doing? From what I knew then to what I know now, of course you're always learning. I would like to feel like from this time last year to now, and I'd like to think that next year, looking back on this year, you'd always go, I'm pr improving and I'm growing. But I was all, you know, I, I was aware enough at that point as well to be like this, you know, the other named opponent, that is not the right fight because he's too experienced and he will know when you're bluffing when you're tired um, and we won't have that situation that I was talking about where that doubt might creep in the championship rounds where really we needed something like that because we knew that Billy Joe's f fuel tank was far from full. Um, but it was just the the first time being exposed to the, that type of criticism and things like that, I would say I didn't question what I'm capable of doing. I questioned if, if I wanted to do that, if I wanted to put myself in a situation to be open and take things like that. But, um, you know, like I said, I stuck with it and I'm pleased that I did. Well, gladly you did because that brings me on to Los Angeles. Yeah. Uh, Fury Wilder won, one of the most historic heavyweight fights in, in recent times. Just talk to me about bringing Tyson back. Mm. Um, you know, people were thinking you were crazy, Tyson was crazy to even be talking about Deontay Wilder. So talk to me about the process out in Marbella, training with him to bring him from that point to, you know, arguably beating Deontay Wilder the night, on that night. I know it was a draw on paper, but we all saw he won. Yeah. So, obviously everyone knows the story of the first time I, being in Marbella with Tyson and training and uh, him asking me about being his coach. Initially, I'd said to him, look, don't rush into any decisions. You don't have to make a decision, but if you want to carry on working, he went back, I went back. It was a little bit of a break there from, from him actually training and he just sent me a random message and was like, are you ready type thing? And I was like, what do you mean I'm already? He was like, I'm ready now. Are you ready? Like, I need to get cracking. I want to start now. I was like, so you want me to, to be your coach? And he was like, yes. Yeah. So I was like, I've, I've actually got a fighter fighting on this date, but I'm regularly up Manchester way for sparring, etc. I can meet you up there three times a week to start. Once that fight's out of the way, then I can... He was like, I want you to move in with me, blah, blah, blah. So obviously we went through that, went through the Sefer fight, went through the Pianetta fight. Actually, did uh, I remember being going into the Pianetta fight, we was at Tyson's house and he got a phone call about this potential Deontay Wilder fight. I, You know, originally and initially, the agreement was that he was going to have four comeback fights before even looking at a big fight. That was what I wanted, that was what he initially wanted, that was what I was happy with. Um, so when this offer come along, I was a bit like, you know, I don't doubt that you can beat him, but you're definitely making it a closer fight than what it would be if you gave yourself enough time. And I actually think I did the interview with you after Pianetta to say, I'm not all for it, um, but I, I remember being, back at home after the Pianetta fight. I don't think it was, everything was signed because um, they'd done the announcement in the ring and all that, didn't they? Or sort of a face-off. I don't think they announced anything. And I remember speaking to Tyson after and he basically said to me, like, I feel like my best chances are with you. I want you to be there, but if you're, if you're like, I'm doing the fight with you or without you. So I was like, I feel like your best chances are with me. Um, so I agreed to do it. Obviously, John wasn't happy with it. Um, but, like I said, I felt like Tyson's best chances were with me. So we went over to, initially we started off training camp in Big Bear. Because um, we done we had to go to America to do like a bit of a press tour, etc. So there's no point going there, coming back to then go back. So we went to America, done this press tour. I remember on the press tour, they was doing shooting the advert, and they've done all of these press tours. And at one of them in LA, I think LA might have been the last one. 
might have been, and it got a little bit feisty on stage. And we went, yeah, it was in LA, and we went to go shoot the the advert for the for the for the fight. And Wilder was there taking his shots and doing his promo videos, and Tyson's run up behind him and dropped his shorts, and I thought, like, I think Tyson then felt like. I've got in his head because all this has gone on. I'm being his friend, I'm being his enemy, I'm being nice with him, I'm being hard with him. And that was initially what Tyson said he was going to do from the very morning of good morning. He said, like, I'm going to keep switching it up on him. And if he just takes it how I take it, I know I'm leading the dance, I've, I've, I'm in his head. So, um, yeah, initially we started off training camp in Big Bear. After a little while, I feel like we realised that probably it wasn't the best so I'd heard about altitude training and all the rest of it and all the people that have trained up in Big Bear and we thought it was a good idea. Went up there, quickly realised that it's probably not the best approach after speaking, finding out a little bit more about altitude training, etc. To do the full camp up there, so we come down, moved to LA, obviously started working out of Wildcard in Freddie Roach's gym. And the training camp went well. The training camp went very well. It was very confident. Um, going into the fight. I remember initially sitting down looking up. In America they're quite strict in terms of you sitting back from the ring from the corner, not actually sitting on the steps or on the, co on, on the ring. And I remember initially the first thing I thought was, fuck me, the speed of Wilder. That was what initially took me by shock. Um, but what else sort of stands out in the fight? Well, considering the performance against Seferi, Pianetta was a, a much better performance. But, but still well off where it needed to be, Of yeah. course. How good a performance was that in Los Angeles from Tyson? Yeah, you know, there was a lot of work focused on weight loss, obviously going into Seferi and Pianetta, and then going into Wilder, the focus was on boxing and, and how he needs to approach the fight how to take away Wilder's right hand, etc., etc. Um, tactics, scenarios, etc. So, I was confident going into the fight, and I remember when the fight started up, I, I, I felt like Tyson was on, on song straight away. Like I say, I remember thinking, the speed of Wilder took me back a bit, but then I remember how quick Tyson was to, to regain control of, of situations and scenarios and... Um, his anticipation looked on point very early on. And he, he was, he was boxing out of his skin. And uh, one of my worries was, as the fight started to go on, Tyson was changing his height. I think I actually said, BT done the thing in the corner. And I'd said to him, you're changing your height, but you're not stepping in, getting your shoulder in, stepping in to close the gap. And... Uh, he got dropped off of that and then I do think Wilder started to aim his right hand lower because Tyson was dipping down, but Tyson wasn't dipping down and stepping in. And I'd mentioned this to him and the adjustment wasn't quite happening. So I was thinking, closing the gap, I'm not sure. And then there was a, a round or two to see out. And I was like, look, you don't need to take any silly chances, don't need to... And then obviously he got dropped in the 12th from that, changing his height but not actually closing the gap or adjusting the distance. Wilder aimed his right hand down there because Tyson had been doing it a little bit too much. And then, yeah, I remember thinking that was it, the fight was over. I think everybody thought that at that moment in time. And then he got up and I thought, I need to assess the situation, look who he's in with. But the referee had said to us in the changing room, that we will, when you get up on your, if you get knocked down, when you get up on your feet, we'll ask you to move to your left or move to your right, just to make peace. And the referee's words were, because anybody can just stumble forward if we ask you to move forward. So they said, we'll ask you to move left or move to the right. Tyson got up and done that famous little jog. And I thought, he's got his legs underneath him. He seems okay. His head seems relatively clear. And he got through that moment. Then I think... That 12th round set the, the tone for the rest of the trilogy, I feel like. I think that Tyson then, what well, he did straight away after, he was like, 
I broke him there. I know that I broke him there. I know that he does not want me pushing him back. Um, and he was adamant from that moving forward. When the bell initially sounded, I was 100% convinced that Tyson had won the fight. And then I don't know if I've said this before, but Freddie Roach actually said to me, it's a draw before. When I was like, what? I thought, he's got that wrong. I thought, That's, it can't be a draw. And then obviously it, it got announced as a draw and I was like, like, Mind blown, to be honest. And I remember looking down at Floyd before the sorry, this was before the um, before the scores got read out. I looked, I looked down at Floyd and was like, "Who have you got?" And he was like, Pfft. "He should say Tyson, easy." So yeah, I was very shocked. I think even Lou DiBello came over to Tyson and said, "You won, didn't he?" Quite a few people did come over, like congratulations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um. But yeah, look, it, it was what it was. It set up a trilogy for them to both go on and, and earn, a, earn a fortune and a great rivalry. So, Absolutely. Let's move on to Las Vegas. Um, I think it was Mexican Independence uh, Week. Yeah. Tyson Fury and Otto Volin. What went wrong, Ben? Uh, so, again, so taking into consideration Tyson, for a heavyweight, he'd boxed. Seferi, Pianetta, Wilder, Schwartz, Wallin, all in the space of like 15 months. This was his fifth fight in 15 months. Going into Seferi and Pianetta, he was still losing the weight. So 15 months, five fights, 10 stone weight loss. He was drained. I knew he was drained. And being honest, not being a know-it-all, I knew how that fight was going to go. Um, don't know whether I should say this, but... So we, about four or five weeks before the fight, we went over to America. It was Tyson's birthday. And I was taking Isaac Lowe out for a run. Isaac needed to train that day. Tyson had a day off. We were planning on going out for a meal. And I come down to the bar and said to Tyson, I'm about to take Isaac out for a run. I'll be back, we'll get changed, and we'll go out for this meal. And I looked at him and I thought, he seems a bit funny, but I didn't think nothing of it. So I went for a run, come back. Tyson was bladdered. Absolutely bladdered. This is about four or five weeks before the fight. Absolutely bladdered. It was his birthday and um, it become, it very much become a damage limitation situation. And we was with ESPN team, some lawyers, some of the, some of the top ranked team. And we went out for a meal and one thing just got it led to another and it just got worse and worse and Tyson went missing. We got a phone call saying that he was in, I think it was Cipriani's or something. Bearing in mind, we heard that he was riding around the streets of... <laughs> I shouldn't really be saying this, but it's a true story anyway. We heard that he'd nicked a bike and was riding around the city of New York drunk on a pedal bike. Um, and then we'd heard that he was at Cipriani's. So we went there and I thought, I've, I've like, so at this point, it's like something goes wrong here. This whole top-ranked ESPN deal could be off the cards for him. So I'm thinking, I've got, I've got to do something here to, to try and get him back to the hotel and just get this night over with. So I thought, I'm just going to try and switch on him. And if it's either going to work and he's going to go, right, OK, like, I'll listen. Or he's either going to switch on me and put me in a coma. <laughs> so... so uh, we, got, we ended up walking, I've got a taxi, I can't remember, to, to Cipriani's and he's come outside. He was like, come in, come in. <laughs> so he's come outside. And I was like, I've never asked you for a fucking favour, I said, but I'm asking you, get in that fucking taxi and get back to the, get back to the hotel. Call it a night now. I said, you're going to end up costing yourself this whole top rank ESPN deal. Unnecessary, ridiculous, no preparation, no type of preparation. Blah, blah, blah. And he looked at me and he went, OK. He said, let's walk. So we started walking, just couldn't get anywhere. He was bladdered. Couldn't get anywhere. Everybody was stopping him. Tyson, Tyson, I thought, there's going to be a situation here that we shouldn't have allowed to occur. So I was like, we need to get in a taxi. So we got in a taxi. And uh, he, 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 he was going to me... Um, 
I love you for what you've done for me and blah, blah, blah. So I was thinking that worked. Then the next breath he was like, but if you ever talk to me like that again. So my head, I'm sat in the, on the back seat behind the driver and I'm thinking, if he hits me, my head's going straight through the window, I'm dead. But then the next breath he was going, but I love you for what you've done for me. I don't know if I should say this either, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, got back to the hotel, calmed down before he, uh, he went to sleep. And he was just, I think he even spraying champagne all around the lobby of the hotel. Just was on a mad one. So I, uh, I put two sleeping tablets in his drink, trying to get him to go to sleep. <laughs> and I remember, I remember just see it, looking at him, thinking he's good. Like everybody was off, was pretty much in on it. Like he's gonna go, he's gonna go, and he would come back. Then he'd go, and he'd come back. Then he went, and I thought, right, got him. Leave it a couple of minutes. Then we'll have to try and get him upstairs. It was like. Rising from the dead, it was about 30 seconds he was gone for and he just went warm, back alive and I was like, I don't know what else we can do here. Um, so preparation didn't start off great. Then we got to Las Vegas. The problem with Tyson is he's good enough that if he doesn't want to, if he wants to coast in terms of sparring, he can do. He can move them around, steer them, mess them around and, and get through the rounds. And that's sort of what was happening. Whereas the camp before, Tom Schwartz, the sparring was, he was on fire. I can't remember if it was the Schwartz camp or the Walling camp, but we, uh, we took Isaac Lowe for sparring with a former world champion at the Mayweather gym. And everybody was banging on the canvas. It was like the Mayweather lot versus, versus uh, our team. Tyson was there. And Isaac sparred really well. I think they'd done eight rounds or ten rounds. And Gannett, the, the lad had just spent, shot his load trying to get Isaac out of there in the round before. And Isaac sort of come back and was like, like, that'll do type thing. And one, I'll give Isaac his due, you know. He's got plenty of heart, plenty of courage, plenty of will, desire. He's a game lad. Um, a lot of pride. And I knew he had a lot of pride, and I knew that the lad had just shot his load trying to get rid of Isaac in that round before. So, t so I said to Isaac, yeah, no problem. I said, just go let him know that you're done. And I remember Isaac looked back, looked at the kid and was like, fuck it, give me my gum shield. Went out there and Isaac ended up getting the best of the, that round as well. So yeah, Isaac had a great spa. Um, and then one of, one of the, the Mayweather gym lot come over and was like to Tyson, We've got a heavyweight in here. He said, here, knock your ass out. All this. So Tyson was like, no problem. Sparring on Friday, 10 o'clock. Tell him to come. I had no idea who it was. Woke up Friday morning. You've been tagged in a post, Instagram or something. So I clicked on it. And this, this fella, I'm outside the, the top rank gym and Fury's not turned up. This like half eight. So I was like, fuck no. Hell no. So I went downstairs. I was like, Tyson, get your shit on. We're going to the gym. These idiots at the gym, don't give them a chance to get off. So everyone's quickly rushed, got their stuff on, turned up at the gym. Looked across, big lump, yeah? Who is it? Christopher Lovejoy. Didn't know who Christopher Lovejoy was at this point. Just a lump, 18 and 18 knockouts. Didn't really know who it was. So I said to Tyson, um, let him know straight away. So Tyson's come out, touch. Touch, left hook, right hand, ba bang never mind a 360. He's done about a 1080. And uh, so Tyson sort of looked at me as if to be like, what the fuck's the crack here? So I was like, just finished the round off. Um, but the end of the round, Lovejoy's ended up, didn't know where he was. Walked over to, to our corner. I was like, not over here, mate, over there. And then he got out of the ring. But all that camp, that was, that was, that was the Schwartz camp. All that camp, Tyson was on fire pretty much dropped every sparring partner. Um, he really was, really prepared well for that. Um, then, as I was saying, so with Wallin, he, 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 like I say, he's good enough to just cruise if he wants to cruise. So I was thinking, I don't know if he's just doing that bit of complacency or if he's actually Fatigued, so I thought, right, I'm going to bring, not going to name any names, but I thought, I 
knew a very good big southpaw, tall southpaw. So I thought I'm going to bring him in and he'll give Tyson some good work, three rounds or something. So Tyson straight away, first round, just set about him, bullied him, battered him, just to put him in his place. And then again, I, Tyson was just able to, to cruise through. But I knew then, I thought, this he's fatigued here. And I remember a conversation back at the house where Tyson said to me, what do we do if if Wallen's out boxing me. And I looked at him and I said, half the reason why I'm happy with Wallen as the opponent is because you're too big, you'll be too strong, you've got too much heart and too much bollocks for him if it goes that way. And I remember Tyson looked at me as if to say, we're both on the same page, knowing how the fight was going to play out. Because just knew he was fatigued, probably a fight too many. Like I say, five fights, 10 stone weight loss inside 15 months, it's a lot for someone to take on board and he, he just was fatigued. I remember someone else in the team was like, can I come in? The, like he'd become a little bit of too much of a, of a circus, like cameras every day. And I understand ESPN was pushing him to become a star, which he has become. Um, I also remember in the fighters meeting, Tyson saying to Andre Walls, and I don't know if he said this on purpose or he said this just subconsciously knowing it's going to be a bit of a messy fight. But he was like, I want half my face ripped off in this fight. Mexican Independence Day. He said, I want to put a show on. That was what he said. And I remember the American version of the fight, Andre Ward actually mentions that in commentary. Fury asked for this. Um, so there was a lot talk, spoken about the weight. Uh, I did not, just like to clarify, I did not want Tyson coming at that weight that he came in at. Not at all. Um, he was 18, 11 or 12 for Otto Wallen. I think we wanted him, for, sorry, for Tom Schwartz, we wanted him to come in at a similar sort of weight. Um, I think he ended up weighing in at like 18-1, 18-2, something like that. But yeah, we, we did not want him coming in at that weight. Um, just, again, he was fatigued. I don't know if he was ill slightly ill, but he was sitting at about 18, eight in the morning, something like that, and then he just dropped that week down to about, yeah, I think he might have even weighed in 17, 13 on one of the mornings, and that was when he had said to me, you know, like, my weight's come down, like, a bit concerned type thing. But then you've got to be careful, because you can't just start shoving all food and any food into someone, because, you know, if their gut's not used to it, he was on, not on a strict diet, but he'd been having foods that he'd been having to fuel him through sessions, and then all of a sudden just go and eat junk food. That can cause people to be ill, diarrhea and be sick and things like that. So, yeah, it was a bit of a difficult situation. So, I remember warming up in the change room, Isaac had just boxed, warming up in the change room, and someone, this isn't a joke by the way, someone kept farting in the change room. Initially, I thought it was Isaac Lowe, because Isaac had boxed and the lads had him some five guys for after he boxed, so. I remember looking at Isaac and saying, don't you fucking doing that in there. Like, if you're going to do that, do it outside. And I just remember Tyson putting his head down and sort of turning away. And I thought, that's him. It's him that keeps dropping his guts in there. And I remember even during the warm-up, I thought, we're going to have to work on being up close here. Like, I can just see how the fight's going to go. And uh, so that's what we've done. We adjusted the warm-up. Started working on it, being up a little bit closer. Um... And then initially getting into the fight, I thought it was clear Otto, what, what Otto Wallen was going to do. He was going to look to work the body, etc. So initially I thought Tyson would be able to make him reach from too far out using his lead hand. Otto reach to the body, Tyson clip him with a little hook as he reaches in or meet him with a backhand as he comes down to the body, which Tyson did actually do hurt him. I think it was in the first or second round, meeting him with a right hand as he looked to go to the body. Then Tyson obviously got the cut which I don't know if had something to do with um, if he wasn't well, his weight being lower, might have been a bit dehydrated, etc. Um, and then, then it had to sort of make a decision how, how soon was the question of do we close the gap? Because my worry there was if we look to close the gap too quickly, 
and Tyson uses size too early and up close and that cut gets worsened by rubbing and head clashing and being a bit closer too soon. If we're in the fourth round and that cut's at its worst point because of all that, there's a chance they stop this fight. Initially in the corner I was told it was deemed a clash of heads and then um, the ESPN reporter actually come over to me and was like, oh, how do you feel about the, the, the cup being deemed a punch? And I was like, no, no, no. The referees told me it was a clash of heads. And he was like, they've just let us know, the commission, that it's been deemed a punch. And I was like, oh, shit. So, um, you know, I wanted the fight to get, I wanted Tyson to get through a few rounds first. Like, he was winning the rounds. It was a messy fight. It wasn't great. He was lethargic. But he was winning the rounds. And I thought, I wanted him to get a few rounds in the bag before he closed the gap, got closer, used his size and physical advantages because the cut was going to worsen from that. Being up close, being inside, heads rubbing, arms, gloves, etc. The cut was probably going to get worse. But I thought if the referee's looking at it too early and he's saying we're only a third of the way through this fight and that cuts, there's a chance they stop it. But if they go, we're halfway or over halfway, let him carry on type thing. So I thought that that was the, the the biggest decision I had to make in that fight was how quickly do we look to to close the gap, get inside, and Tyson to use his size and risk that cut. Um, but I feel like we've done a good job getting through it. But the main thing I would say is Tyson was very lethargic, fatigued going into that fight, and um, you know yes it looked messy wasn't the greatest performance, but it was a win. I think it didn't help with John on BT after, you know, sort of giving it to us all, um, which I understand, you know, look, he's a dad watching from afar. He wasn't able to be in America, um, upset, not able to be there with Tyson. I fully understand that. I think people have this perception that I've, me and John don't get along, but I see John, you know, Royston has boxed on a few of Tyson's cards and, you know, me and John get along. And actually, me and John used to really get on, like, when we'd be in the hotel in Manchester, John would sit in my room for hours, hours upon hours, and uh, he'd talk about his life experiences and I'd soak those life experiences up. And we'd have some great conversations and we really got along. And sometimes when I would make decisions that Tyson wasn't happy with, John would always stand by me. Um, and we'd, you know have conversations regarding boxing, like I say, about life. And like I say, when I see John now, I, I get on with John, there is no problem. Um, I understand, you know, Tyson's his son, and uh, they're a very close-knit family. I understand his frustrations, and don't hold anything against him, of course. Well, that was an eventful night in Las Vegas with Fury and Wallen, a stay in Las Vegas for one of the best nights for British boxing, uh, Josh Taylor, becoming undisputed champ uh, against Ramirez. I guess the only downer on that point was uh, Josh couldn't get his uh, fans mm. across to Las Vegas, obviously during COVID times, but what a night for him and yourself, Ben. Yeah, it was gutting that he couldn't get his fans over there, but I do think they also made it quite special because there was a very small knit group of people that was there for Josh. So after the fight, it become, you know, Josh was there with the fans, sort of in and amongst the fans that were able to be there. And everybody celebrating together, and um, yeah, uh, I would say with that fight, camp went well. When we first went over to America, there was a couple of things there that we made a couple of adjustments for. Um, the last week of sparring, I remember Josh sparred, and you know, it was he was on fire, very confident. Had a conversation with Josh that I, I remember specifically as well. Just he sort of said to me like. I know the game plan, like, trust me, like, because I was on him, you know. So I said, go on, then you, you, you tell me what it is and what you need to do. And he went, boom, 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 boom. And I thought, right, he's got it. And, uh, yeah, he was very, very cool, calm and collected. I remember in the changing room, Josh, very confident. My worry was being a little bit too fiery, a little bit too tense. Big moment against an aggressive fighter. Josh is a 
a fighter himself, you know, but we wanted him to be cute. We knew that he could bring Ramirez. Josh is a fantastic counter puncher. Knew that he could bring Ramirez onto a shot. And I remember there was a sticky patch, I think, in the third round, it might have been, where momentum started to pick up for Ramirez. Josh done something, and the sort of moment snowballed. But Josh very quickly tamed him, got it back under control. Um, and there was something specific that we'd been working on. Josh bringing him on to, bringing Ramirez on to a shot. And I remember going into the sixth round, I was like repeating it for one minute what he needed to do. And he come out in the first 15 seconds, drop, boom, brought him onto the shot, dropped him. Um, and then, I can't, was it the next round that he dropped him? I think sure, so. it was the next yeah. round, yeah, with, with the uppercut. Josh, fantastic. Inside, created a little bit of room, bumped him off, left uppercut. Um, and, yeah, I, I remember again at the end of the fight thinking, very confident that Josh had won. My only hesitancy with that fight was, you know, I felt like Ramirez was the favourite there with top rank. Mm. He had the crowd there as well, and I, but that was my only bit of hesitation with that result, waiting for that result, if I'm honest. And then the result got read out, and uh, yeah, I've, st I've got a video of us all celebrating in the ring after. It's one of my favourite videos, actually, um, just looking back on the emotions and that. So that was phenomenal. Look, what, what, what I do it for is to help these lads achieve their dreams and their goals and, you know, to go beyond that. Josh will say, you know, in my wildest dreams, I, I was very confident I'd become a world champion, but to come, become an undisputed, you know. So to, to help him achieve that was, uh, was great. You know, it's, it's, it's what I love to do. So it's, it's definitely up there, one of, my, one of my top moments as well. Yeah, I'm sure it is. And then a, a week later, uh, you had Devin Haney, obviously part of Team Haney, helping him uh, in camp uh, against Jorge Linares, mm -hmm. again in Las Vegas. Um, yeah, talk to me about that fight with Linares, obviously defending his WBC world title. Yeah, so with with Devin, um, I met Devin in a gym. I think initially we got talking about a watch. I had a yacht master on, and we got talking about a watch. But he walked in, and uh, I think he had like a fifteen man team. He was twenty one years old, I think, at the time. Battered these two sparring partners, and you know I, I'm quite soft hearted, and I felt you know the sparring partners I was trying to help out, and I said. You know, maybe next time if you try this, maybe next time if you try that. So Devin sort of looked across the gym and was like, coach, let me get some of that work. And I remember straight away thinking, 21 years old, 15-man team, WBC world champion, smashed the life out of two sparring partners, wants more information. How can I get better? What can I do better? Straight away, I thought, I was impressed, very impressed. And he come over and I said, I thought this and I thought that. And he was like, dad, dad. He called Bill over, who's obviously his coach, and, and was like, Tell my dad what you said. So I was like, oh, I thought this, I thought that. And this is no word of a lie. I was back home watching The Last Dance with Michael Jordan. And I remember how desperate he was just to get 1% improvement. Um, they, they was talking about that in, in, in the documentary, in the series. And I remember walking upstairs thinking, reminds me of Devin, that. That's what I thought. And I remember I looked, went on my phone and Devin had messaged me, hey, coach, would you be willing to work with me for my fight? Initially, the fight was going to be April 17th in... I think it was going to be it was going to be somewhere else, and I was like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it because I've got Josh in May in in Vegas. Turned out the fight got moved to Vegas the week after Josh worked out perfectly. Um, I've got a funny story about in camp there actually. So one of Devin's prospects was sparring someone, and uh, could see what the season pro was doing. He was he was trying to let Devin's prospect punch himself out. So then, but Devin could see it as well. So Devin was like, right, that'll do all kicked off and hell no, hell no, get him back in, give me two rounds, I'm going to stop him. And the guy went, 2,000, 2,000, I'm going to stop him. I had some money in my bag, so it ended up being my money that we put on, on the bet. But the guy didn't know this, the other guy didn't know this. So he's in the ring and he's looking around the gym on who to ref it. I'm the only white guy in the gym. So he's looked at me and went, you. So I was like, yeah, no problem. It was my money. <laughs> Anytime there was a clinch or anything like that, when I pulled them apart, I pushed them about 15 feet apart just to make sure that uh, the money was safe. So yeah, we won that bet. Um, preparation was good. 
you know, a good, a good, uh, had a good, good team, great team spirit, but also had a good understand of everybody working together. I feel like in that camp, um, Linares still a dangerous, really dangerous fighter. Um, you know, one of the elites. And I remember being surprised how relaxed and calm Devin was in in the changing room before the fight. Um, I remember he come back it he, he straight away. He started fast. Um, and was really in control, and I remember he come back and was like, he can't punch, he can't punch, and I was like, just relaxed, like. Um, and he boxed out his skin, really boxed out his skin. You've never seen anybody rack up rounds like that against Jorge Linares. Even Lomachenko wasn't in the same level of control that, that Devin was. Obviously got clipped with a shot in the temp, done a good job tying up, smart, didn't get carried away, didn't let ego take over, um, done what he needed to do. Um, you know, and that was great. I don't think there's many, if any, British trainers that have been employed by American and American world champions. So, you know, it was great, great for me to 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 work with with Devin, and uh, you know, we, we continue to work together. So, um, obviously, at the moment, it's remotely, but great memories, yeah. For sure. Right, well, we started in Scotland. Let's go back to Scotland. Um, your last fight with Josh Taylor um, against Jack Cattrall. can answer both these questions in the same breath. So we know Josh has admitted, if you've admitted, it, it was the worst performance Josh has had of his career so far. So why was that? And also the backlash. How did you deal with that as his trainer? Because I haven't seen backlash like that after, in many people's opinion, the wrong result. So you can answer both in the same breath. Um, what went wrong with the performance? I think that, so initially, we all, Josh included, had to worry of Josh getting up for the fight. There was always that, that worry. And preparation was not great, not through a lack of trying. Josh is a great trainer, great trainer, really works hard in the gym. But I think that perhaps in terms of little details and diet and weight and things like that, you know, there was a few, a bit off the mark there. I think his sparring was, was poor for the fight. Um, in terms of performance, again, I think it was a lack of, a bit of complacency, a lack of motivation for the fight. And to be honest with you, Josh did keep saying that through the training camp. He was like, I just feel like I can't get up for the fight. That's what he kept saying. Um, so there was always that worry. I do, I always felt like, I said I said some things in, in, in the build up to the fight, like feel like it's a showcase performance for Josh. I knew Jack stylistically was a tough matchup. Was always aware of that. Um, if I'm being 100% honest, I did partly feel like the occasion might get to Jack. Might get to Jack? Yeah. In Scotland, oh. the atmosphere up against the Undisputed is a big jump up in levels. But levels don't mean shit. Levels mean nothing. Styles make fights. Um, you, uh, you have a world champion spar someone who's not on his level but have a hard spar and people go, did you see that? Not so much levels, is it? It's styles. So, yeah, I just feel like Josh really struggled to get up for the fight. Um, I remember straight away thinking, just thinking Josh looked off straight away. And I remember thinking, I remember this, being honest. I remember thinking Jack might, the occasion might get to Jack. I remember looking at Jack and thinking, look, cool, calm and collected, that's not getting to him. I remember thinking that. And I remember Josh starting, I thought, he, just, he doesn't look on, like, just looks off. Look, looked how he looked when he had a bad spar, put it that way. 
And I think Josh knew that. Josh is an emotional character. I remember when he was getting inside, he was sort of gritting his teeth to be like, oh, out of frustration, didn't quite feel himself at times. Um, and Jack looked on, looked on song. So um, it, it made the fight look how it looks. I, I do think, you know, there was a big element of, probably going to get some stick for this. I do think there was a big element of um, expectation. So I think people did think, oh, it's a few round job for, for Josh here. We didn't feel like that. And I actually said that to Jack after. And I think that the cleaner work was from Jack. But I think that the volume and things like that, while the commentary was talking about that shot just landed from Jack, Josh is doing his work there. But the focus is still... And I feel like a lot of people struggle to actually grasp their own views and listen to the commentary. And it can influence things, I think, personally. Because there wasn't this controversy in America. Now, I'm not saying it wasn't a close fight. I can understand people giving it to Jack. But I do think... Um, it was a close fight, and I can understand people giving it to Josh. When I sit down and score it, there are rounds that I think, that could have gone that way, that could have gone that way, that could have gone that way. So, yeah, I, you know, it was one of them fights. What you like. Um, but I think a lot of people was taken back. Like, pff, often, I'm not saying this is the case, but what I'm saying is often when a fighter does better than what was expected or better in the next round than they did in the previous few, if they'd had a few rough rounds, automatically they get awarded that round. Now, I'm not saying that was the case in this fight, but what I'm saying is that can often happen. So I think there was an element of people, well, I didn't expect Jack to, to actually be competitive. He won that round. Um, but he is, he's a world-class fighter, Jack, and uh, it was a competitive fight, and I, I can see it going, I can see an argument for, for either way. And I think a lot of the backlash, being honest, a lot of the backlash come from Josh being interviewed straight after the fight, and I think that emotions and all the rest of it are high. And I think Josh said something like it was an easy fight. And I think that that started a big part of the backlash. But you've got to remember, Josh has just been in a 12-round fight. Emotions are running high. Adrenaline's flowing. I don't think people took that into care. I think that started it, if I'm being honest. The sky went quite strong as well, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, but people around went, went went quite strong as well, yeah. So, but I remember during the fight, being honest, I thought, pfft. I remember thinking it's difficult. And I remember when the ref took the point off of Josh, I remember looking at a couple of people that I know and was like, what do you think? And they was like, pfft, as if to say, either way. So, yeah, difficult. Not the best of memories, obviously, but I think you know you're going to have ups and downs, aren't you? And um, yeah, there was a lot of backlash. I mean, I think that starting off with backlash for me helped me prepare for it. I do feel like I'm probably the most critiqued coach in the country by a long shot. I went six and a half years without losing and was criticised. I had a loss and probably got more praise from that than I did actually winning. So, but, you know, like I said, talking about Scotland, and the first fight that we discussed, I think that um, that actually prepared me for what to expect doing this job. So I think that I find it, that was probably the first time Josh had ever received criticism. I'm not saying he, he found it hard to deal with, but I think it was new for him. Probably, you know, added a bit of frustration because it's almost like people forget what he'd done leading up to that. Um, but it's the way of the world, isn't it, unfortunately? Well, yeah, thank you very much for your time, uh, going through your highs and lows. Uh, an incredible story so far, and uh, I think there'll be many more years to come for yourself um, as a professional trainer. Ben, um, on this podcast, just to close off, every time we uh, have a wild card question. So as you're a trainer, um, I'm going to ask you, there's one fight in history of the sport um, that you'd want to be in the corner for, and obviously which fighter you'd want to be in the corner with. Um, yeah, go and pick one. I would probably say it's between Mayweather and Canelo in the corner for Mayweather because I feel like that was such a good chess match for however long. 
until Canelo fatigued. He wasn't able to process. You know, he struggled to, to maintain that for the 12 rounds. He was only 23 or something at the time. But leading up to that, the first few rounds of brilliant game of chess. Brilliant. And I remember Floyd straight away after was like, that's the next star of boxing. He knew, you know. Or Mayweather and Pacquiao. In, in Floyd's corner? In Floyd's corner, yeah. Okay, so you're clearly a big Floyd fan. Yeah, yeah big Floyd fan. Like, I don't know him personally, obviously, but in terms of boxing, I think that he is... For for me, he's the best to ever do it. Okay, well that wraps up. Uh, and I think he's one of the on, rare. Man. Sorry, I think he's one of the rare few of fighters at that level that he's able to probably not. You know, he's not a coach, so probably not to, but he can articulate what he's doing when he's in there in his own way. But I think you can understand the gist of, of what it is that he's explaining. He's able to articulate, I did this because of this, I did that because of that. Oh, if you look at that moment, I was doing this, which then led to me doing that. So that, that's one of the other reasons why I'm, why I'm a big Floyd fan. That wraps up today's episode of the Fights That Made Me podcast. Please make sure to like, comment and subscribe and we'll see you next week. Thank you very much. The nappy purse. Do we do enough? Well, I never shot up at it. Uh, must have been about 17, 16, 17. We nicked their guilt wins. Right, the bouncer's guilt wins. This is no good for me. That's the reality. If you want the honest truth, and I see it every day.